as you mentioned, I'm the former national managing partner for Grant Thornton's public sector. I was at Grant Thornton for almost 18 years, where we grew that public sector practice from around when I, when I joined around 225 people to over 1,200 people. And people are your your biggest resource in a professional services firm, right? This is, you know, this is what we do and understanding and bringing the right level of expertise, culture, et cetera. We did have a very successful acquisition by Veritas Capital, where we were merged with Guidehouse, which is one of their portfolio companies, which was very exciting, you know, for everybody to to become part of even a bigger organization that is now rolling up into another private equity firm. So the the tremendous opportunity that those folks have a 30 plus year career in professional services, mainly as a government contractor, but I've gone back and forth. I've, I've done a lot of uh, financial services as well. I was a Price Waterhouse, PwC, IBM. So as I like to say, three three business cards, one phone number, going through the mergers and acquisitions there. So I was very used to that and understanding like that, you know, how things change. But I did spend a lot of time in my career going back and forth from financial service into government. And you realize the value of of expertise when you have to do that. Like that the financial services clients that I had, either in mortgage banking or insurance, were very interested in what we what we had done for government, the scale at which we did it, right? And then when you come back into government, it's it's that insurance, that private sector expertise, because a lot of what government does is is financial services. When you think about government, they're 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 a big bank a big financial services institution, they do insurance, right? They do loans, they do, et cetera. And so bringing that expertise of what best mm-hmm. practices were and what was happening in the private sector back to the public sector really, I think, helped you know, fuel my career, certainly. Um, that, that's that's tremendous. I'd just love to learn a little bit more about you know the ways that expertise delivered value for your organizations that you've worked with. Maybe mm-hmm. Grant Thornton, you could speak to others. Where where was it most important, and how did and how did it deliver value? You know, it could manifest itself in many ways, right? For specific government programs, we we were at the Department of Energy working with their loan program office early on years ago after the financial crisis when they when congress passed the advanced technology vehicle modernization act and, and they created the, the, the atvm loan program and it was very critical that we could bring com- both commercial expertise in how you do diligence on on a variety of companies but also the specific automotive industry expertise and we were able to leverage that by going across Grand Thornton globally to identify the right resources that we could bring to bear to help the Department of Energy as it was executing these loan programs. And then that expertise had we had we were dealing with large, you know, call it large Fortune 100 automotive companies, and we were dealing with startup companies like like a Tesla. And you have to have specific expertise to under, you know, in understanding the difference between a startup and a large, you know, Fortune 500 company mm-hmm. as you're going through the financial diligence of those. And so expertise can be very pointed in that mm-hmm. regard. And it can also be very specific to an agency, as an example. Grant Thornton, we I think we did a tremendous job. One of the things that really helped us in our growth path was our commitment to our cohort of former government executives. It's we found it very difficult when I when I first was there to retain the former government executives for for the long haul, right? And 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 integrate them into the fabric of what we were doing. And we created a specific program for our, our former government executives to help them through that transition and making sure and, and demonstrating to them how they could bring their expertise across multiple parts of our business, right? Whether they were a former CFO, because then they could talk to other CFOs, or they had a specific expertise in an agency such as the Department of Transportation or the Department of Homeland Security. Right. Understanding the culture of an agency, how things get done, 
brings a tremendous amount of value just as that domain expertise, whether you were a CIO or a, a CFO. That's super interesting. So if I understand this correctly, the rationale for this program is Grant Thornton was hiring a number of former government officials, but saw an opportunity to deepen the integration of these. Can you go into a little bit more of why this program needed to exist? Like, why was it a challenge for these government officials to fully integrate into Grant Thornton's work if that was the problem? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's a different mentality, right, from being a public servant and coming into a, you know, more profit oriented business that still has a public sector bent, right? You know, our mission, right, is still to help government to improve how it it becomes more efficient and effective and how it serves its constituents. So we still have that public sector bent, but, you know, people get a little frightened of selling, as an Mm -hmm. example and and you know and then now they're delivering it's really a roll up your sleeves grant thornton right we weren't looking for people who just to to leverage a rolodex if you will right we wanted to make them into good consultants right and Mm -hmm. good and good you know business partners with, with you know within the organization right and so teaching them the skills right to become a good managing director or partner in the firm, you know, not just, you know, a sub a subject matter expert, right. Or somebody who's just got relationships, right. Mm-hmm. We want them to be solving our helping solve our clients problems and out there with our mm-hmm. teams and finding the right individuals, right. Who still want to give back, but also want to leave their legacy and, and mm-hmm. teach the younger folks, right, mm-hmm. about the agencies, about careers in government, about how government really works. It's it's often, you know, really interesting to see the the true mechanics of how sausage gets made, right? And that that experience that it really we gain from having those people on the engagements, working with our younger staff to really help us understand better how government works. So these, these they were not just subject matter experts, but they became kind of full-fledged consultants, but obviously leveraging mm-hmm. their uh, mission orientation, as well as just their knowledge of customer pain points and challenges mm-hmm. on that side. But still, I would imagine you had kind of a, a need to mobilize them when opportunities arised. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could share a little bit more about how you did that, because as you're kind of adjusting your focus with the business, there are new opportunities. Were you able to easily identify all the talent and knowledge you had from this cohort? In what ways did you did you try to try to address that? Well, many ways it was easier with this cohort than it was with the rest of the practice, right? And, okay. You know, because it was a, a such a smaller cohort of the overall, then everybody knew who the former government executives were. And by bringing them together on a recurring basis where they could collaborate and coordinate, right? And and talk about an opportunity or anything that, that, that we had going on where there might be specific subject matter expertise would often yield an understanding. Let's say we needed, we learned that we need some property management expertise and we didn't know this other person had that in their background, right? Those conversations would would really percolate those things up so that we could then tap into that subject mm-hmm. matter expertise on a specific opportunity. And, and you know, we, we won work because of that collaboration, right, mm-hmm. and coordination and understanding. But it, it was more organic. It was, you know, a lot of what is needed and, in, in what, you know, what we were starting to think about and I think what On Frontiers brings is the more innovative side of this, right? How do you identify resources or unearth resources in your organization, right? That may have a meet a, a specific requirement in a in an RFP, right? Have done a certain type of work or use a certain tool. It's very hard to maintain knowledge management systems. They rely on human input, people trying to keep their resumes up to date, right? And, but if, you know, 
and you can sit there and try to think, okay, well, who, where did we solve this problem before? But if, if you use innovation to identify people, maybe who were on a, an engagement where we were doing the same thing mm -hmm. and then querying and then beginning to them specifically, it may not be in their resume in the resume database, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be in the past performance mm -hmm. call that's in the database, right? Mm -hmm. Not everything gets in there, all the relevant details. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you know, how, how can you identify that? in a way that we'll find those nuggets, the, those real diamonds in the rough. And, and why is that uh, an important challenge for public sector businesses to solve? Oftentimes, right, an RFP will have the need for a specific requirement, as an example, right? And the only people that can be, that can fill a certain labor category have to have X number of years of a tool or X number of years of experience in a, in a certain topic area. You know, we, we were going after a very large financial statement audit. And one of the key missing pieces that we could not solve for was somebody who had nuclear energy experience like and you and you could not meet this key personnel requirement without it and we ended up having to just drop the bid because mm -hmm. we couldn't meet a key personnel requirement. This is after a lot of effort of doing all the upfront capture and, you know, the things that we thought we could do to unseat an incumbent and that little, you know, requirement, but a key personnel requirement that we, we could not find that mm -hmm. needle in a haystack mm -hmm. made us have to turn off mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we could not submit a, a compliant proposal. Did you get this? Are you confident that that person did not exist within your organization? Oh, absolutely. Idea? Yeah, we we researched far and wide. I mean, internationally, mm -hmm. it, it did not, it, you know, as, as am I confident? Yeah, I'm confident we did everything we could. Does it mean they don't exist? I, I don't know, right? You know, they they very well could have. But it's also the power of being an incumbent, right? Where you have a resource like that, there's no question because you're already doing the work. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so if I'm the incumbent, I want that position to be key personnel, <laughs> right? And so it's not that we didn't try to get that changed either, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to play the proposal game, if you will, right? And mm -hmm. to work with clients to, to get requirements in there that mm -hmm. can narrow the competition. Mm -hmm. And personnel is a, is, a, is a great way to do that. Yeah. How, how can you defend against that? Like, what are the, what are the strategies for, or is that the kiss of death? Well, one is, you know, the sooner that you are going into capture and you're looking at your gaps, right, the better. Mm -hmm. Did we maybe start that capture a little too late? Did, you know, were we not prepared? And then, you know, by the time we, you know, turned around to look at the, the next five year recompete of that contract, we were already doing other work within the agency that, that created a conflict from us even bidding on the work anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, other decisions were made, but the, get, you know, getting these, these resources, right. And identifying the, you know, the, those resources is very difficult, but you gotta, you gotta do it sooner in the process. So, looking at big opportunities and starting call it two and a half years before the mm -hmm. RFP is going to drop, right? You know, what are you doing to understand, to gain customer intimacy, right? To be meeting with the client, to make, have your past, your other clients talk to them about your capabilities, mm -hmm. et cetera, understanding what those requirements were, right? That are likely to be in that that RFP and addressing your gap. So it just, it, it does take time to do, and you can't, you know, it, the, the shorter that window is, the more likely you're not going to get there. 
Great. Just wanted to shift gears a bit. And, you know, you talked about the growth trajectory at Grant Thornton from, I think, 250 employees to 1200. That's incredible. But at the, at the, you know, at the latter end of that, that's a significant scale organization. And the public sector also was only one part of the broader Grant Thornton at the same mm-hmm. time. To what extent were you conscious of silos within that organization or in the broader Grant Thornton? And was your point of view that they impacted the business and were something that you should do something about? Absolutely, right? We we did get to a point where we had become siloed within our organization, right? And many organizations have you know, various business units that they will create and they'll create business unit leaders and they'll all have their own PL, right? And be running their business. But then they're not coordinating, right? They're run they, they think they're running their business and they're semi-autonomous business units. And I had to break that apart because it was not in the best interest of the organization, right? To and, and to bring it back to having you know, we have one PL, right? And change the metrics of how people were incented and to really hone in on the collaboration in metric and how are people working across the organization, both horiz- you know, horizontally and vertically, right? And the vertical, the, the accounts and the horizontal, the service lines to bring the whole practice, but really to bring the whole firm. Right. Mm-hmm. Where we were very successful was also with integrating with our commercial counterparts. So healthcare being a really good example of that, where we could bring a single team that had expertise both in public sector healthcare and in private uh, sector healthcare and how and what was going on and what were the best practices. We won many engagements, not because others didn't try to bring it but didn't bring it in a way that was cohesive, that it was one Mm -hmm. firm. And that's where we really won was because we really had that one firm mentality. So it wasn't, it wasn't just the culture and the way we operated within the public sector unit. Although I think we did it better Mm -hmm. than, than most, it was how the whole organization right. And the incentive structures that, that people had Mm -hmm. to grow the whole firm. Right. And so I, I think you, you need to think about like how you could be creating silos where you're sub optimizing and personnel is like a, is a very easy example. Right. Like people will be in a room and you'll have a proposal team and they're and they're only bringing their knowledge and what's in their heads and what they know and who they know. Right. And oftentimes they're missing things because they're not thinking like, well, what, what about this engagement over at this other agency that we mm-hmm. did? And they don't know about it. And so we're not even bringing the best past performance, much less mm-hmm. the best best resumes mm-hmm. to the table. And that's what happens in a siloed organization, mm-hmm. right? And one that doesn't have sort of also that innovative mindset to how can mm-hmm. we better make sure that we're leveraging all of our resources and all of our assets and mm-hmm. how do we identify them? Mm-hmm. You know, I've heard a lot of executives talk about creating one one organization, um, breaking down silos, but I also am aware of how difficult it is. What are the particular challenges you had to overcome? And did you come up with any strategies that actually other other executives in a similar position should consider? It wasn't easy. It, it, it meant that some people who had been with us weren't going to, you know, as I always say, sometimes those who got you here are not those that are going to get you there, right? Because, you know, who has the right mindset? Who is going to evolve into the the new culture and the things that are needed to do this, right? Versus continuing to do what they do and think that, you know, they're semi-autonomous business units. So the hard, that's the hard part, right? Is, is the people aspect. I firmly believe one of the ways to do it is not, it's not a top down. It's you have to do it bottoms up. Right. So you kind of know the answers, you know, but you ask the questions and having the team develop the strategy, develop the framework, the go to market. Right. 
then they have the buy-in about how are we going to do this? How are we going to go from X dollar revenue and get it, get that exponential growth factor to get to the stretch goal? And when people, when you bring those people together to, to pull together that go-to-market strategy, then they are bought in. It's their strategy, not mm-hmm. the CEO strategy. And mm-hmm. I think that's what, changes the dynamic and we involve people at all levels we did a series of workshops we had consultants senior consultants and and on up and we created different working groups and asked them what Mm -hmm. things do you think we need to fix if we were going to change the organization Mm -hmm. to do x y or z right what do we need to do from a talent perspective what do we need Mm -hmm. to do from a business development perspective and the very interesting thing was, and you know, you you come up with all these initiatives that you have to do in order to to start executing on the strategy, and so then you have to prioritize. Mm-hmm. And what we did is we 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 then survey people and ask them of these things. What 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 are what do you think the priority should be? And it was very it was it was a completely opposite answers from the senior folks from the more junior folks. Mm. and you know what they thought should be prioritized and we went with what the more junior folks because they are on the front lines they are the ones who mm-hmm. are you know executing and doing you know they're the arms and legs and that paid tremendous dividends both in them feeling heard and again mm-hmm. buying into the the strategy and, you know, those investments yielded the right changes that, you know, really, I think, spurred our growth. That sounds tremendous and interesting and also unusual that you would give that much credence to uh, frontline professionals. It's also sounds challenging to do at scale and costly. Like, how were you able to do it? And did it become a one-off thing or a continuous method of engaging frontline professionals it it, it it has to be continuous right it can't it, it can't just be a one time right and then giving them a sense of giving them the ownership over the implementation of things and then make the communications are are, are critical as well right showing them like when we've hit milestones or that we've implemented a recommendation that came from those initial sessions right and look we did the thing that we all talked about and we created this these these staffing pools and this is what we're doing now because this is the idea you you all brought to the table Mm -hmm. about how we could better communicate how we could better help you with your professional Mm -hmm. development as an example and so the communication was key in the measurement of what you're doing we had a concept, you know, what we called our purple chips at, at Grant Thornton, right? It's a, it's a business strategy, right? Every, everybody's got like your white chips and the things that you've got to do day to day. But what are those really important things that are going to move the ball forward, right? And everybody should have one or two purple chips. And what are they doing? And then laying that out and, you know, through the, the talent mm-hmm. and performance process so that, Mm-hmm. People had some accountability that in X quarter that they were going to deliver, you know, mm-hmm. their goal was to deliver on a purple chip. So it sounds like these, this is a, sorry, we're going a bit longer, but I think this, if you have a couple more minutes, I think mm-hmm. this is a really interesting concept. Mm-hmm. It sounds like the purple chips concept, it goes almost by definition above and beyond your normal job responsibilities. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And what, right. Could that, what could that entail? And for example, yeah. Well, you know, your day-to-day responsibility as a professional service firm is to mm-hmm. deliver exceptional performance to your clients, right? Mm-hmm. To meet and exceed their expectations. So that's your day job, right? Is to make sure that we are meeting mm-hmm. our, our clients' demands, their, their strategic objectives, we're helping them, but we're, we're doing that, you know, mm-hmm. at, an, at, a, at a level of excellence, right? Like mm-hmm. above and beyond. So that's your day job. But then there's other things that move the organization forward, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we, we talked about innovation, right? And there's innovations that that need that you need to implement. So maybe it's creating, you know, a tool that all the consultants can use 
to start implementing, like forecasting their time better, right? Like getting your time forecasted of what you're doing was a very, very big, so we could understand kind of where people were going to be. Mm-hmm. And the consultants created their own tool to do that, right? Wow. And so that was a purple chip. That was a project. And there were a few people that whose responsibility, and then they had a, a partner sponsor, right? Whose responsibility was to make sure that was delivered. The other, the other thing is, you know, rotating people around an organization and being, you know, making sure that people get a broad array of experiences. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes in siloed organizations, that doesn't happen. And, you know, people are constrained and they're going to be in this business unit and getting the move across. We did away with that and had everybody, uh, all the staff into a single pool. So that mm-hmm. people could be more easily moved, they could, and if they wanted to become an expert at a domain or a, a, a service, right, they could go do that at many places. But if they wanted to really hone in on homeland security or HHS as accounts, right, or and and that's they, they were more mission oriented, that's what they wanted to do. That they could still they they could do that, but they could also get an array of experiences within that account mm-hmm. because you want to build people that have that that you know the the more the more broad experiences, and mm-hmm. so the initiatives that we had to make sure that happened to put in place the the processes the structures right those were our purple chips, right? Like, because it just doesn't happen overnight. You know, what are all the things that you need to do to make that happen a reality? And then how do you maintain Mm -hmm. that? Okay, last question. (laughs) Totally convinced by the importance of that pursuit to catalyze a more inclusive strategy and collaboration across a otherwise siloed organization. To what extent did the tools that you used that were offered by your broader organization for HR, knowledge, et cetera, really support you in that mission? And and to what extent did they let you down? Mainly it was the letting down, right? You know, the, they all require some level of human input and things to to make them work. And, And often they were outdated technologies. There wasn't a lot of initiative, but thank goodness that the technologies of today and some of the tools that we get out of the box with Microsoft, as an example, like with the Power Apps, with Power BI and things allows our allows everybody in the organization to innovate and to and to create. The the key is to give them that license to do that, that permission to do that, to create a culture of innovation, right? So at one point we, we were training all of our, we started training all of our people in Power BI and those types of business intelligence and data analytics tools that they, that they could be using every day with their clients. And it started changing the relationship we had with our clients because we were delivering data in a much different way. We're delivering, we're creating our deliverables and giving them insights in in a much more powerful way. So we had, we had to create that, but, and also giving them access to, to tools like power apps where they could figure out like, how could they make something on their project work better? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then those tools would, you know, we might then take those tools and put them across different projects Mm -hmm. but you have to give license to people to to do that Mm -hmm. to be creative to you know and to do things and it's on top of their day job yeah fantastic 